Welcome to The Happy Doc. My name is Taylor Brana. In this podcast and related website, thehappydoc.com, the goals are to inspire, develop knowledge, and provide tools to enhance your creativity, joy, and success as a health professional. Our guests provide their stories, tips, mindset, and much more, which have allowed them to succeed in such a demanding field. Our next guest is Dustin Williams, an internal medicine physician. Dr. Williams is the lead educator and founder of Online MedEd. He's the clerkship director of Baton Rouge General Medical Center, and he's a teacher in the Baton Rouge Internal Medicine Residency Program. Dustin's online med ed videos and notes have personally made it tremendously easier to go into clinical clerkship and shelf exams with more confidence. Guys, just take a listen. This is a great interview and Dustin has some awesome tips and he's super funny. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone. This is another episode of The Happy Doc, and it is my absolute pleasure. I'm kind of like fanboying right now because this guest uh, has totally helped me in my medical school career. Um, and this is Dustin Williams from Online MedEd. It is so great to have you. So, uh, could, Dustin, could you introduce yourself for a little bit? Yeah, sure. I am, I am Dustin Williams, Dr. Williams, the lead educator and founder of Online Med Ed, and also the clerkship director at Baton Rouge General, affiliated with Tulane University. And uh, I also to help teach the residents there at the Baton Rouge General Internal Medicine Residency Program. Awesome. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure many people recognize your voice. Um, I can say from my own class that many people have listened uh, and watch your videos. And, you know, we're all studying for boards. We're all studying for our shelf exams. And what you do is really fantastic. So I would like for us to dive right into kind of what spurred you to develop this program and, um, you know, why did you go through this process and what's your, what's your vision with your work? So if you want to know the answer in detail, buy my book. Um, the intern guide actually has, the, for the opening couple pages, explain the journey to this point. Um, and I don't want to bog everyone down with uh, the infinity of the story, but um, basically I think that I felt what everyone else felt, that med school sucks, right? That students succeed in spite of their medical school, not because of. And at some point I was like, I can do this better, right? Like I know I can. Let's be clear, I could not, but I thought I could then. And um, I've always been an educator. So I, um, even when I was bartending class, I made my own bartending class at Yale. When I was a paramedic, I helped teach the EMT class. And I didn't really realize that I was doing it, that it was my passion. But I was good at it. And I'm good at uh, taking information that people portray or having a lot of stuff, and I think this is why people like online med ed, organizing it in a way that people can understand and retain. So uh, the flip switched in third year medical school. I was sitting in an OBGYN lecture, and it was called contraception. I was like, cool, all right. You know, at the time, Yaz was on TV, and I walked into that lesson uh, thinking, well, I don't know that much about contraception. If someone asks, I'm going to prescribe Yaz. Two hours later, I don't know that much about contraception. If someone asks, I'm going to prescribe Yaz, because that's what's on TV. <laughs> The dude spent two hours going over the difference between estrogen and progesterone and the amount of time that a woman could have to miss a pill in order to uh, you know, stay, stay effectively contraception. And the answer on the test was OCPs. Now, this is right. before the, the ring and the, the IUDs became popular. It, so, but it, even still, like, we didn't talk about IUDs. We didn't talk about implants. We didn't mm -hmm. talk, it was like, all right, so there's condoms and pills. And the answer from the test was OCPs, and I was like, look, that guy was a great lecturer, and he was really good, and it was totally appropriate for reproductive endocrinologist obstetricians. We're all in third-year medical school. The entire, none of us were even going into OB. Yeah. So I realized that people like to teach what they want to teach. No one taught them how to teach. And so then I was like, okay, I can do this better. And at the time, I had Jeff Weiss, who's the program director at Tulane, and he's a big time medical educator, has a couple of books, and Chad Miller, who was the clerkship director when I was a student there, um, and they both gave me opportunities. Right? And so I, I sought out the opportunity to teach a, a, anyone below me. And 
I just took a little bit of their training, a lot of practice, and about uh, 8,000 hours in front of a camera. And it, I did okay. I mean, the first video is which you will never, ever see. <laughs> in fact, I've burned the hard drives in which they're on. <laughs> were so bad that my girlfriend at the time who was filming would fall asleep filming. And I would be over on the right side of the board and the camera's still on the left. And they just were factually incorrect. And they just, ugh. And then I understood why people suck at teaching. is because no one puts in the effort and the energy to do it. But I was determined. So sure. kept practicing three iterations later, 10,000 hours. I'm not so bad at it anymore. <laughs> Well, I can honestly say that you're doing a fantastic job from my point of view. Um, and there's a couple of things I really loved what you said, but um, I'm really interested, actually. So you said that you you started teaching a lot even before this kind of process happened and that education may or may not have been your your passion. Did you notice that, like, growing up that you loved to teach even prior to medical school and prior to, like, you were talking about your paramedic um, you know, bartending classes and stuff. Did you notice that you had maybe this gift of teaching others? I don't think I realized it until I started doing online med ed. Mm-hmm. I, 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 could, I thought I was just smart and good at things, you know, and, and I, always, I did always have the need to give back, and I seemed to grasp concepts well. I memorized poorly, and people always think that I'm going to be great at Jeopardy, and they've always turned down the opportunity to play medical Jeopardy because I don't memorize facts when I have methods, and I, I, I can work through problems, but I can't remember details. So that's like, and that helps people learn. Uh, I didn't know that I was doing it. I just had this, and now I recognize it because I've seen a the therapist. Um, and now I know that I have this, my value in life is contribution, right? The, I don't right. care what happens necessarily to me as long as I'm able to give to others. And so my personal sacrifice of not sleeping and working on these things and slaving over them for hours on end is amplified by the fact that it's on a website, Literally yeah. anybody can learn medicine from me. And, and I like it because I don't have to meet people, right? And, and I don't have to uh, deal with the emotional consequences of someone succeeding or failing. But I, I can just give to the entire universe, yeah. well, the world anyway, but amplify. Yeah. And that's, that's the really cool thing, right? You, like you said, you obviously reiterated, you worked on this stuff for a really long time. You spent like literally ten thousand hours, even though you went through those painful experiences with your girlfriend falling asleep, which is hilarious. And and then it's cool because you know if the, obviously if one video isn't up to snuff, you can change it out. And now you just have this online platform, which again literally like changed my personal life, which is why I was a hundred percent like wanted you on here. And yeah. you're just helping many people, and it's so cool because you're actively helping people like you could be in the clinic like today today you're working you said you know you had your meetings and you're you're helping patients and meanwhile you're still actively actually helping people even though uh you're not necessarily doing it you know it's in the digital space and that's totally cool so um that's great to have you in terms of the the contribution that you're doing that's great so you know i'm i'm familiar with your website um in terms of, just out of curiosity, um, what are your future dreams? Are you trying to build this out even more? What are your, what are your future goals and aspirations with the site? Yeah, so um, Jamie, my co-founder, um, is the, the person who's directing the ship, right? And um, he shares the same values as I do. He got his degree from Tulane as well. And um, what I want to do is keep making content for students. And, and, and Jamie sees the grand vision of, of turning this into something more. And, and you hit it right on the head, right? We've created an online platform. We have basically said we've curated the content for you. And if you believe us, which you should, um, you can come to one place and learn what you need to learn. And so that worked out great for step two. And when we started, uh, a reason why I chose step two is one, because there was nothing here mm-hmm. when I started. And, and two, uh, I, I like the idea that the illness script is fixed, right? There's no curveballs. You learn the classic presentation and the normal workup, which is appropriate to learn for a third year. Yeah. So the, where we want to go um, is both vertical and horizontal. We want to go into other 
specialties entirely, like law and um, get your CPA and maybe nursing. Mm -hmm. uh, but where we're going to start is by going through the history of medical school, right? So uh, we, we're going to start building step one content this year so that you can walk into medical school, use online med ed only, and get through the entirety of medical school. And then on the other side, we want to keep developing the intern content. Um, we have our peer reviewers right now working on cases and ways of bringing more truth um, and that, that statement, truth, um, I believe that understanding is more important than truth, especially for the student where you need to know a specific level of information. Mm -hmm. But when you go to residency, you're going to learn all the details and realize that online med ed ain't it, right? Yeah. But we also want to create content for the person who's starting internship and then who's going to go through residency and sort of curate the, the truth as it goes for, forward. So the grand vision of this is, and this is like 10 years away, sure. right? MCAT to continuing medical education. Right? Mm. You, you, you come to one place, you have the same quality, the same compartmentalization, the same efficiency of learning at every level, and then also go into other education spaces. Sure. Wow. Well, and that's, and that's fantastic. And if you have that continuum, um, obviously that, you know, streamlines the entire process. And, you know, I did a little bit of research, you know, kind of reflecting on some of you know, the stuff that you've, you've stated and maybe in previous interviews. And one thing I saw and I thought was interesting is you, you had this idea of maybe even flipping, you know, we talk about flipping the classroom and you said something around flipping the clerkship. Uh, can you expound upon that a little bit? Yeah, that's what I do in Baton Rouge. I, um, I basically say it's far better for a student to show up knowing what everyone expects them to and then take it to the next level rather than having students show up to learn what, they're, what they needed to learn anyway. So um, very much in the Khan Academy, and when I first started, people were like, oh, you're the Khan Academy of Medicine. I'm like, who's this Khan? <laughs> and now, now I realize that was, that was a compliment. Right? Um, the idea being uh, that you can use online med ed or product like it to have the student on their own time, in their own way, study at their own pace. Right? And that's our, that's our motto, pace, prime, acquire, challenge, and force. Mm -hmm. Read, watch, do the questions, note cards and quick tables so that the students come in to class having learned all the fundamentals. So that as a third year medical student, I can put a real case in front of you, and I do this, which asks very difficult questions that don't have the right answers. The third year student then, at that point, is not learning what an EKG is. Right? They're learning, yeah. like, well, does this person get therapeutic Lovenox, or does this person get a plavix load? Does this person get a cath? Right? Which, which one is it? And the answer is, in real life, you don't know, right? You never know. Mm -hmm. But so you have to make decisions. And all of a sudden, you go from just teaching at a board, catching everybody up, to everyone leaves the classroom far more advanced than they would have been at any time. And then the, the, the clerkship still needs to be a clerkship, right? The exper medicine is experiential. You cannot learn to practice medicine without doing it. Sure. And, and so by using something like this, which gives the medical knowledge component so efficiently, it allows students more time to actually be with their patients or look up that disease because they know I'm going to learn everything I need to learn in my clerkship by just by going to online med ed. I can focus on taking this patient's case to the next level. Sure. And, and you know what? I can speak on that on a personal level because I remember I was freaking about, about like my um, internal medicine sub eye. And I was like, you know what, I'm, this is my sub I I want to look good. So I ended up, you know, you know, it's not the best method, but I ended up cramming with your videos, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, watched not only the internal medicine stuff, but also uh, the internal medicine videos, but also the intern content as well. Because as a sub I you're supposed to act as an intern. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to say, I, I felt tremendously more comfortable. And there were times where I was... Uh, able to figure out issues or discuss problems at a level that I could not have previously. So, I mean, and not only that, I learned more because I had prepped prior um, and applied the information. So, you know, it, it's definitely a great model and it's a much more proactive approach as opposed to the kind of sit in and passively start to listen and take in information. It's too late, you know. It's This is like reading the lecture material and then being ready to go. So um, definitely agree, and it's like all for it. And I, I hope, honestly, that's kind of what I wish things were now, you know. Um, and you've, you've obviously seen the frustration, and I continue to, you know, in my own life, mentor students, and, and they're frustrated. So, I mean, 
thank you. Yeah, I mean, keep yeah. doing what you're doing. I agree with your your vision and your your message and what you guys are doing. And uh, yeah, if there's honestly, I mean, if you want to even say this now, if there's any way that you know anyone listening could help you guys and support you guys, please. I mean, now's the time. Let us let us know if there's a way we could support you. Buy my book. Buy my book. No. Okay. <laughs> But really, so actually, the thing that I like that question actually being serious, one of the things I like about working at Online Med Ed is because we've actually built a community, right? There are people who are actively asking to participate, and we don't have the bandwidth to help them, right? So if people want to contribute and they want to do something, or they have a great set of notes on a topic and they want to share them with us, please do, right? Um, Making content is extremely challenging, right? It takes hours of research to just make sure we have it right and get it right. Mm -hmm. If people want to contribute by um, providing resources, writing questions, or, or doing something like that, they certainly can. Now, we don't want a deluge of everyone's notes, right? <laughs> That's not what I'm asking for. Sure. But if someone's really interested in, in helping out with the, with the content creation, especially in the step one space, um, we're actually start re- looking for avenues to get that content right. So if someone wants to help in the step one space, contact Jamie. Awesome. So there you have it, guys. If if you you know if you're interested in the mission, if you believe in the vision, and you love educating, like there there you have it. I mean, just email Jamie. So um, with that being said, um, I wanted to kind of move on from you know this topic and get to know a little bit more about you. So what was your vision of being a doctor? You know, you have this greater vision of what it was going to be like going into medical school versus the reality of being a doctor. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think it's going to be everyone's story, right? By the end, by third year, there's that paper out like five years ago. By the third year, everyone's super jaded. Um, sure. I literally thought that all doctors were doctors. I was going to go be an orthopedist, which is funny now because that's like the big joke, right? The hospitals <laughs> take care of the orthopedics patients afterward <laughs> because the orthopedists don't, aren't real doctors. They're just monkeys with hammers. Now, and I also respect them because I can't do their job, right? I have no idea how to fix a bone. Um, but like that's the now like the 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 joke. Uh, rivalry is orthopedics and medicine. Uh, and I, I started off with medical school thinking that everyone was like I was, right? Um, it took me three times to get into medical school. Probably a little too hard in college, but I uh, made it for it later. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I walked into medical school thinking that everyone was going to be altruistic there to help people that we all had all fought, scraped, and saved, and were going to be these amazing people. The reality of medical school was that most of the people were douches, right? And I just, I didn't get along with a lot of people, had a lot of uh, anger issues, high blood pressure, gained a lot of weight in medical school. Medical school was not what I thought it was going to be. It was hard. It was, I got overworked. And then I hit the OR for real, not not just an observer. Uh, glasses were all fogged up. It was hot as shit. The light <laughs> on, I was sweating my ass off. I was like, cannot do this. Nope, 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 nope. Uh, and then I found internal medicine, and this is not a poke any on any other specialty. Everyone, I think, cares. Everyone wants to do a good job. Everyone helps patients. But for me, um, what I thought a doctor was was found in internal medicine, right? I, I often joke with people that I'm house, right, mm-hmm. without, without the opiate addiction and the, the crippled leg, although I do have a Morton's aroma right now, so I've been hobbling around and okay. people are calling, are calling me house. So I'm like, all right, all right. <laughs> so, I did, and I've always been excited by um, figuring out the differential diagnosis, the, the 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 connection with the person to you know draw out what they're trying to tell you um, by by using their words or by convincing someone that you know you you are trustworthy and they can open up to you and by doing so you find out something that someone else didn't do or you put the pieces together to get the right answer and actually help somebody. Mm-hmm. So, uh, for me. Being, I'm the first doctor in my family. No one had any idea, right? My parents both graduated college, and you know they were like, "My son's gonna be a doctor," you know, and that, that was that was as much as I knew about being a doctor. Mm-hmm. So, um, I didn't realize the sacrifice. I didn't realize the 120 hours every week through medical school and residency. There's an 80-hour cup. Sure, there is. Not on studying, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. And the reality is that as you, I think we began this conversation with, the, you know, the people get frustrated, people get depressed. Med school's hard, residency is harder. And actually, um, in my book, I have the five stages of death and dying in residency. And it was um, modeled after my own experience, uh, both in medical school and again in residency, right? You, you just like, denial, bargaining, depression, anger, and eventual acceptance. And 
that no one teaches you that. <laughs> no one says it's going to be the hardest thing you've ever done. No one says that you're going to work more than you've ever worked and you're going to lose all your friends and interests. And if, hey, if you, at least if you exercise, you're doing good. Right? If anyone said that, then we'll fuck, I'm not going to be a yeah. doctor. What the hell? And then on the other end, you have this massive crippling debt with 8.5% from the Department of Education. It's like, what the? Mm-hmm. But then you actually practice. Right? And I don't think in medical school you can see it very well. But once you actually start taking care of people, you realize, again, why you did it in the first place. Right? And that's uh, you know, the inscription on the back of the book. And it, you're going to see people at their worst. Right? And you're going to see people at their best. And you're going to make these people better. And you're going to heal the, the sick and mend the wounded and comfort the dying. And there's no better mission than that. Right? Wow. No one knows humans better than a physician they don't realize it because all you do is look up at the people who are better and smarter than you and ever ahead of you. But really, if you ever look down, there's the other 99.9% of the country in terms of ability to understand, know what's going to happen, right? It's just that has the power to keep people going. And so I always tell people, if you do feel down, remember that the end goal is. Right? It's not getting an A, a or a B on your test. It's not getting uh, honors on the, the shelf. It's the end game, right? It may be five or six years down the road for some people, but... It's worth it on the other side. Yeah. Wow. And uh, I love I love that message. And you know that's one of the things that um, you know I'm actively trying to promote. You know, with you know these interviews and you know listening to someone like you is, you know, giving these pe- giving people that that concept that you know things are going to be okay and we're working towards something much greater and much more deeply fulfilling. Obviously, from what you're saying. So a follow up to that is. You know, can you give an example of one of these fulfilling moments or a, a moment of of great impact that you know really made made you feel like, wow, I'm 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 doing something. Uh, this is all worth it, and you know, this is what I wanted to do. You know, I, when you, and you started asking that question, the thing that jumped into my mind is actually fourth year of medical school. Um, I've done more impactful things since then, obviously, right? Sure. Um, but uh, I used to volunteer at Bridge House at a clinic um, where recovering addicts were, would live, they'd work, and they'd all live together. And on th- the Tuesdays, we Tulane students would go and act as their physicians. And fourth years uh, led the the clinic, and first and second years were doing that as part of their community service hours or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And uh, I heard a student who was a third year coaching a second year, the, the drapes closed, and they were using one of my advanced organizers. Right? They, were, <laughs> they were coaching the, the people below them the exact way that I coached it. And I like, peered around the corner, and I was like, I'm pretty sure I didn't teach this guy. But it was like word for word exactly as, as I mm-hmm. did it. And I was like... This is awesome. Like, literally, I taught someone something, they taught someone else, and they're teaching someone else, someone else, someone else. Like, then the, the message just got propagated. Yeah. And I hadn't done anything yet. I was a fourth-year medical student, right? And it had, it, had, it had an impact that meant that other people were, were teaching others. And I, I think that that's really why I teach. Um, Weiss, in his book, has the four phases of teaching, and I got to the fourth phase pretty quick. And I think that is the big difference. Most people teach because they have to as part of their contract or because it's fulfilling to the self, their ego, their, they want to get awards or whatever. But the phase four is when someone that you've taught is on their own and doesn't have your supervision, they make the right decision. Whether that's on a test or in real life, if they do the right thing, there's no one there to congratulate you. They may not even know that you taught them, but they make the right decision at the end of the day. And I see that happen a lot in the residents I coach in particular, the people who at the beginning of the year didn't know what to do and were doing all the wrong things. And all of a sudden, by the end of the year, they're just, they're making all the right choices. They've done the right things. And I'm like, thumbs up. Good job. Wow. Wow. And, and that's like so much more powerful because, you know, as you said, it's, it's not even for you. It's not about self gratification for you. It's literally like, I want to make the world a better place. And by you teaching that one person and them obviously propagating those good lessons or con- conceptual, you know, organization or grasp of the material, so to speak, um, they're able to utilize that knowledge. And you didn't necessarily do that directly, but indirectly, that influence, that, that's what gives you joy. That's, that's a really um, fascinating way that you find happiness through education. That's awesome. 
Yeah, it is. It actually is very strange. Um, and I, when people, I still don't know how to handle the celebrity, right? When people like fanboy, I'm like, okay, I'm kind of uncomfortable because <laughs> uh, you know I don't do well with personal accolades. Like I don't. It's, it's it makes me uncomfortable when I meet someone who wants to photograph. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty good at it now. I fake it, right? I take the picture, do the autograph. Sure. But but like my like that makes me uncomfortable. Right? That makes that makes celebrities really happy. But like I don't. I I, mean, I didn't I didn't do this for you to come thank me. Like I, I appreciate mm-hmm. that you want to thank me, but that's not why I did it. And so the in this sense, the, the 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 contribution and the global good is really what actually gets me going. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. And um, this is something actually that um, you know a lot of like motivational speakers and people who are successful they talk about finding your why. Like why do you do this? You know why are you going into medicine? Why are you working this? And it really seems like you've really found it. You know you found that thing that gives you energy to work on something. You know you already work an absurd amount of hours, you know, no, no one can say that you don't, you know, even us trying to organize this interview, for example, was difficult. Um, but on top of that, you're putting in this extra work to do something for the greater good. Um, I think that, I mean, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but this kind of sounds like you gain energy by working on this stuff rather than being drained from it. So let's be clear. I'm not Superman. I also don't <laughs> sleep very much. So <laughs> I believe that my personal sacrifice is worth the greater good. But yes, I do get energized by this stuff. And, and, I'm, I'll, and I'll say it to everybody. In, in medical school, I, I got depressed and I got angry and I got high blood pressure. In residency, I got depressed, I got angry, I got high blood pressure. As an attending, I got depressed, <laughs> I got angry, I got high blood pressure. So, you know, an actor really, if you're, you know, I, I'll be honest with people now, like I, I saw a therapist for like six months, like every week or every two. And it actually helped point me to like this realization like I always knew it right but now like it's been codified I know and like start with why by Simon Sinek like I know what my why is and I don't deviate from it and it was awkward because a lot of other people didn't understand it. some people still don't believe me right? and I'm like well I mean it is what it is so uh, it, it, it's it's somewhat unique I found my why and I stick with it and I try to I mean, everything that we do with online med ed I make sure that that the the, the the focus is still on students getting what they need. That's how I contribute. And actually, we just hired a chief operating officer to lead up marketing campaigns. And we joke that he's the, the evil villain out, out <laughs> to make money. And, I, and I'm the altruistic good guy who wants to give everything away for free. And we find balance with each other, right? It is a company, and we do want to make money because we want to keep going. Sure. But at the same time, everyone's, I have the veto power, right? I'm like, no, we're not doing that, right? Like, that, that's totally against the, the why of the company. And um, we, we need help with marketing, but at the same time, we want to I make sure that the, that the the why is always there. It's part of what we do. It's why we do what we do. It, the how and what should follow. Sure. Wow. Well, that's, I mean, that's great. I mean, really, it's, uh, it's awesome that you're following that passion and that why. Um, and just to, you know, say to the listeners, I mean, Definitely, if you want to explore more, I mean, you you had just mentioned a resource there. Um, But knowing why you do what you do, I think, um, can really feed into giving yourself some more energy. Um, So that's that's fantastic. Um, With that being said, um, you know, you did mention a resource. This is something I like to ask people is, you know, if there's one book that really influenced you or a resource that you would recommend people check out, um, what would it be and why? The intern guide, an online med ed. No. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, um, I actually spent um, a, bit, a bit of my fourth year um, reading books on inspiration and psychology and sociology. And I tried as the first half of the intern guide is actually one or two page snippets of a lot of these books. So the, the intern guide, in all seriousness, I'm, uh, you know, I'm joking about buying my book a lot from The Simpsons. But I, um, I really think that uh, it's beneficial for people who are in medical school who are going to or going into residency, regardless which one they're choosing, the book is obviously written for internal medicine. The back half is the medicine, but the front half is life lessons, philosophy, psychology, sociology, that I think everyone can benefit from. And I drew from a a number of resources, a lot of TED Talks, um, and I actually have a list. Um, I used to do a um, a, a a seminar on um, what I called motivation, manipulation, and management. Uh, I like the alliteration, Mm -hmm. but basically it was leading people is the same as running a team, is the same as being a manager, and all of these things, uh, you have to treat people as people, 
And, and in it, we explore a couple of the, the different resources that are out there. Um, I think Steven Pinker's Drive is a good one, internal motivation versus external. Mm -hmm. That um, You can get people to push a button, pull a lever by giving them external motivators, like bonuses. But when it comes to things like physicians, you have to appeal to something inside them. Um, Simon Sinek, start with why. This is more of a company thing, but um, his TED Talk is great. Um, you can just watch a TED Talk. You don't need to buy the book. Uh, but the one I th recommend that everyone, everyone read, it's, a, it's dense, it's really tough, it's really hard to conceptually grasp, it doesn't have any specific pointers, but it, it shapes the way you see the world. And that's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Awesome. Well, yeah, those all sound like great, great um, materials to pull from. And I have personally, I, I haven't bought the intern book yet, but after this conversation, I think I will. But I have a friend who showed it to me and I actually started peering through some of it. Um, and it was some really great stuff. I saw the five stages of grief that you had in there and how to interact with others. So I'm definitely um, going to have to check it out um, for myself. Um, so what... Going back and reflecting on your medical school, school career, um, what is something that you wish you had known before starting medicine um, or earlier on in your medical training? Uh, you know, I don't think that knowing anything would have helped. I don't think I would have believed people if they told me. Um, I don't think I realized how much sacrifice it was going to be um, to, in school. I thought it was going to be like college. But I think people told me that and I didn't believe them. So I actually don't think that there's anything that you could do or be told or read that will convince you of what it's going to be like for real. Um, but I do tell people now who, want, who are interested in going into medicine, uh, in any specialty in general, is are you willing to give up your 20s and dedicate your life to something that will probably leave you in debt for 30 years? And when people hear that, they're, they're aghast, right? Like, well, what about helping people? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like the reality sets in, right? I went to Tulane because they took me. It's also the most expensive school in the country. And now as an attending, I have to pay back my loans. Yeah. And that's a huge chunk of change. Now I still love what I do. I still, I'm not going to, not going to give it up. But at the same time, um, it's something you don't think about and you're so happy you get in and you just dive right into it. But honestly, no one could have convinced me not to go into medicine, and I would have done exactly the same thing no matter what anyone told me or any of my experiences were. So I'm not unhappy for my experience. It's just that no one realizes what it's like until you've been through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And that's something I, I would, uh, s again, say as well. I mean, I, uh, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, per se, because you really don't know until you experience it. And, uh, you know, I came in with high aspirations and I had people tell me like, no, you shouldn't do this. You should go the PA route if you're interested. Um, and yeah, you, you really don't know. I love what you just said though, you know, be ready to give up your twenties and be ready for a tremendous amount of debt. I mean, that's very true. There's a lot of fulfilling stuff in there as well, but yeah, there, you know, you don't want to, you also can't lie about it, you know? Um, right. so that's a great, that's a great point. Now, I should say that there's a lot of happiness and joy, and you meet friends, and right, you get you messed up on four local Fridays, and there's a lot of good times in medical school also. But I, that, I, like that's the thing that it's worth doing, first of all, and second of all, you're going to meet people, and they're going to become your best friends for life. So it's worth suffering with other people to have that. But people need to know it's hard, and it's harder than anything you've done. And then you finish that hardest thing you've ever done, and you do a harder thing in residency. Yeah, it's just it, the. The sacrifice is impressive. Wow. Yeah. Um, so can you, can you give me an example, actually, of a, a really tough day? Give me an example of that sacrifice for people listening. Um, yeah, okay, I'm going to be PC. I'll, p I'll pick one in the middle. Sure. Um, uh, I was an intern when they first had the intern hour switch, and my class uh, didn't, wouldn't have any of that, right? So we just we would do call the way we used to, which was when I was a, a medical student, I would stay 30 hours. Um, but you always got some sleep. Right, and uh, it was a bad day in the ER. I was the only one there. I told the resident he wasn't allowed to help me because it was the, like the eleventh month of my intern year. I got to get ready to be resident, and so I just stayed and I did not sleep. I was up for thirty-six hours. Hmm. I was putting orders in the wrong charts, and luckily I had invested a lot of emotional energy into the nurses. And they were like, "Did you mean to put this over here and this over here?" And I was like, "Oh my God, yes, I did." And I was like shooting five-hour energies and drinking monster energy drinks to stay awake during rounds. And 
on the drive home, I, I don't remember it. And it's definitely true, um, being sleep deprived is worse than uh, being drunk. I mean, I don't know how I got home, and I, like, I passed out four hours later. I mean, sleep deprived, low in energy, low on will. I had no energy to, to support people's emotional strength or whatever. And at the same time, while that was really challenging, being awake 36 hours, um, just taking care of people, and it was a tough night with a lot of sick people who needed a lot of my attention, it also goes to show how important it is to build those connections on the floor because that next day wasn't really that bad. I had a bunch of people to help me, and it was the nursing staff and the ancillary staff who saw that I was having a rough day, and they're there to help me. Yeah, wow. And I, I, want, I really want to highlight that. Um, so you're, you're saying that, you know, obviously there's going to be these difficulties, um, you know, on any, on any of these rotations as an intern, as a resident, as a, an attending physician, but you really found that the, the true, like, silver lining or the way to kind of counter that is to develop these strong relationships. And is this, is this something you also dive into in your um, intern manual? I do, yeah, a little bit. Um, this is you know, treat people like people, and it has to do with the emotional bank account. Um, you as an individual have an emotional battery, right, and you give and take as, as you interact with people. Um, but it's really easy to put deposits in the emotional bank account, right? And I'm just spending time listening to the nurse bullshit about what type of beer he likes. Uh, you know, like it, it has nothing to do with patient care, right? So in fact, it's kind of disruptive. And even though it's <laughs> annoying because you have to, you're trying, on your way to do something, he's like, "Hey, talk about beer," and I'm like, oh, "I don't really care," but but I listen anyway because I put those deposits in. And later, when um, I need to do a procedure, the ultrasound is sitting there with the consent signed. Whereas mm -hmm. the jerk-off guy who, who teaches everyone's like crap has to go do it himself, right? I mean, that's just, it's just um, doing small things frequently um, puts these deposits in the emotional bank account. So if something goes wrong, there's something to draw from. And if it's just a shitty day, you have people to help you. And, and then the guy to talk about, you know, if you um, blow off your best friend who you've known for 20 years for lunch and you're like, hey, bro, I can't make it, you just get lunch the next day. If you blow off a Tinder date, and don't show up to the bar, you're probably not going to get a second date. And the idea is you had 20 years of investment with your best friend and two texts worth with the girl from Tinder. So mm -hmm. you need to build people in your environment to be more like your best friend. And big things count, but I think little things count more. Right? Know that someone's just had a kid or a kid's starting school or you know, whatever's important to them, focus on, remember it, and go after it. Interesting. I actually really like, I don't think anyone's ever said it to me like that, an emotional bank account. So just to kind of, you know, summarize and reiterate what you said, essentially like this bank account is, you know, you paying attention to them and your deposit is maybe saying something nice or spending a little bit of time with them. And then you didn't discuss this, but like the withdrawal would be if you need them or ask for a favor, they have to help you out essentially. Exactly. And well, one, if you, ha if you have a bad day, you have an outburst or something, like, you know, that, that draws a huge deposits. But it, usually it's like if you have enough the deposits, it don't really matter, right? Like your friend will, unless you like kill his mother, right? Like your best friend is like not going to stop being your friend. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very extreme example there, Dustin. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, you know, so don't, don't kill your best friend's mom. But, you know, <laughs> that's number, rule number one, right? But it is like the, you, I, the way I see it is that anytime you ask someone to do something, it's, it's a it's a withdrawal from that deposit. Now, it may just be their job. Please go draw the labs, right? But at the same time, if you've earned enough credit, people will just do things without it being withdrawal. You won't have to ask. Mm -hmm. If you're constantly asking people to do something, either they're really bad at their job and you need to help them get out of their emotional rut as well, or you just haven't put in the time. So why are they going to do things for you when you ask, right? You're going to go to the bottom of their list. So the, you know, the deposits are listening. I think listening is more important than saying nice things. Though saying nice things, as long as they're true, is helpful. Um, and actually, I, um, I, uh, we, we're doing this thing right now at Baton Rouge General where we have floor-based rounding. Right? So I, my floor is 5B, and I got moved 3B. And I had shaped 5B to be my personality, mm -hmm. right? Like, like I, I, I flirt with the girls. I like, you know, the, the social worker comes up and slaps me in my ass, right? Like we, I had, we have the, you know, we had this energy that and everyone gets, everyone's fine with it, right? Yeah. Because they know, okay, like this is like, he's, we're just, we're playing around. So, um, and everyone got along very well. I moved floors and I, I behaved the way I behaved on my other floor. I got called into the, for the program director's office. Right? <laughs> And I was like, well, you moved me from my people. Like, I had my people. Right? So I, in, that, in that sense, the, the MACU, the, the 
floor-based team was a really good idea because it allowed me to put in a lot of energy and a lot of effort into a very small number of people, and the, the, the bank accounts were flush. Mm-hmm. Right? I, I moved floors, and I, and I dropped an F-bomb, and be like, oh, you can't swear. Right? That's a deposit because I swore. I'm like, oh, fuck, I forgot. Yeah. to tell everybody that I swear, right? <laughs> right? And so, like, and then people complained, right? So it's, it, it, it was, that's a perfect example where one floor's the bank account was flush, the other was deficient, and I behaved the same way. And things that would not have been a withdrawal on the flush account were massive withdrawals on the new floor. Wow. I mean, yeah, I mean, and I just love that concept, and I think that's some, maybe the main, one of the main takeaways from this conversation um, it, you know, especially if, you know, I'm about to be entering that world as a, as a student and a, about to be an intern, um, is to make those deposits and then knowing when to withdraw when I can, of course, like that's a, that's a great concept. I just haven't heard anyone say it like that. So, uh, that was, that was really cool to dig into there, into that. Um, so talking about happiness a little bit, you know, what is your concept of happiness or fulfillment and how does one do that, um, in the life of being a doctor? Um, skip. <laughs> uh, um, I, but really, it comes back to contribution, right? I mean, I am fulfilled not when uh, I, I get my paycheck or when I go home for the day. Like, I like being at the hospital. I like being in front of a whiteboard. I like teaching. Uh, it sucks when the students aren't into it. I know it's my job to motivate them to want to learn, and I, I, I do that. But it, the thing that hurts me the most is when I'm enthusiastic and energized about a lesson and the, the, the room is dead. And it takes a lot out of me to get it, to get it picked up. Uh, and then I don't know how to help people achieve happiness. You have to know what makes you happy and then do that. Um, the other thing is, uh, I think it's in medical school, but especially in residency, you need to define a very few things that really you want to do, right? That define you, that make you you, that really are the things you want and don't lose them, right? For me, it was teaching. Uh, for someone else, it might be walking the dog, right? It might be Saturday nights with their wife or whatever, right? Like, it doesn't matter specifically what it is, but you, you have to know what the thing that recharges you, the, your own a battery, right? And if, if talking to your fiance who's long distance is not recharging to you, but it's recharging to her, set aside time enough to do that. But then also make sure you have time to recharge yourself. And everyone knows what recharges them. Some people, it's a margarita on the beach. Some people, it's sleeping in late. Some people, it's going to the gym. So you have to keep that. And then the other thing I tell people, especially in residency, is you don't need new friends, Right? You have the people who have been with you the rest of your life, and they're going to be there anyway. You should not treat people poorly, but you don't need to make friends with everybody. Right? You don't have to deposit a lot of, into everyone's emotional account. If you do that, you're going to overdraw. So uh, unless you're in a new place and you really do need new friends, in which case that's okay, um, you want to hang out, you want to party with your residents, you want to be part of the team, but you don't have to f- make it feel like you really need to overextend to make people pleased, right? You don't need new friends and you need to keep the thing that makes you happy. Wow. That's great. I mean, simple and to the point and, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that insight. Um, so I want us to reflect, actually not reflect per se. I want us to imagine a world like scrape everything away from medical school, take away all the scars and the bruises. I know that's kind of difficult, but I want you to envision an ideal world for a second. You know, if you could redraw what medical school would be like, um, if you could redraw what residency training would look like, um, what would be your ideal system and um, how would it be different from what we have now? Uh, I don't know if this is ideal, but this is what we're actually trying to do with online med ed, right? We have all this uh, student content and we're creating faculty mode. I think that medical school is ruthlessly inefficient in both cost and time. And I think that the way medical education is going is not following what doctors need to become. I actually think the LCME and the HDGME have done a good job of putting out the things that need to happen. Right? You need to learn how to work in systems. You need to be a great person. You need to be a good leader. And you need to know a bunch of stuff. Right? That's not all the milestones, but that, that, that is basically becoming a physician is no longer knowing a bunch of things and remembering them all. And also, practicing medicine for the most part, for the most part, can follow an algorithm. As long as you get the diagnosis right, you can follow a cue. Right? Um, if their blood pressure is not good, add this medicine, go up on this dose. If their, insul- their diabetes isn't controlled, go up by this much on their insulin. A lot of things can be automated. 
So what I would like medical school to become is a training ground for amazing people who happen to know some stuff. And I justified medical school, particularly the clinical sciences, because I learned so much in the preclinical years preparing for a test I didn't want to take that now when I re-encounter those things, it's like second nature. Right? I, I don't remember all the details, but they come back very quickly. But I don't think that that's necessary. So I think that an ideal education world, we would have, I think, just the same amount of time. We would use something like online med ed to make learning the stuff you need to know more efficient. But then we would change the paradigm in which we train. Right? It's doing more stuff on leadership, more stuff on communication, more stuff on systems, teaching physicians to be leaders, the captain of the ship who managed huge teams of people, and use those people as extensions of themselves. I don't know how to do that specifically, but that's what I'd like to have happen. And online med ed is the piece that we're building to make learning more efficient, rather than learning from PhDs who are super obsessed with their one molecule for 55 minutes in a, in a dark auditorium. Let the students learn what they need to learn on their own time. And then use the rest of the time to, to craft great people. But I do need to say that met, you cannot become a great physician without touching patients, right? You have to have experiential training. And so I, I do want there to be a continuation of you have to be in the hospital a lot. You have to be in clinic. You have to see people. You have to touch people. You have to actually use all of your skills. And I know, and I'm not supposed to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, residency needs to be hard. It needs to be, and I'm, I was disappointed by the the 16 hour in a, in a row rule, I, I defied it. I didn't follow it. I stayed in the hospital for 36 hours. Now I almost hurt people, so that's why they created this rule to begin with. But I would like to see the 30 hour intern shift come back. I would like to see there be a mandatory nap time, but uh, I would like the paradigm to shift away from there are shifts. Right? You know, you know there's no shifts. We don't work a job. We practice an art. So I, I, liked the, I liked that residency was so hard. It prepared me in a way for the rest of life that now nothing is as challenging as residency. Uh, if I don't sleep one night, it, it doesn't affect me. I just go you know, through the next day because I've done that so many times. So I think that we can make medical school more efficient to make better people, to give them the skills of leadership, and then let them explore their experiential training a little bit in medicine until they find out what they like. And then in residency, they go through and really hump it, where they do it all over and over and over again until it becomes intuitive. When they're done, they know what's easy and what's hard. And they, they let what's easy go to their physician extenders, PAs, NPs, and nurses. And they take care of the hard stuff. And they direct the, the ship in the right direction. Yeah, well... Well, that's a that's a fantastic vision, and the cool thing is too, and you kind of said this is you're already building that out. You know, it's not just a, an idea per se, but you're actively pursuing creating that future um, by making medical education more efficient. Um, so, with that being said, Dustin, um, I I'm I'm out of specific questions for you. I really. Um, I'm absolutely thankful for having you. Um, and, you know, what you're doing, it, you know, you finding your why, you working on what you're passionate about and building out a potentially much better future for medicine and actively doing that is very commendable. And it is, um, again, my absolute pleasure to have you. I'm going to leave um, this space open for you. Was there anything you'd like to leave to the students, to the doctors, um, and to all the listeners that are on right now. Hmm. I already stole my, I'm stole my closing line to uh, most of the talks I give. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say it again. Like, like it really, it's remember why you went to medical school, right? Not the it's cool or it's badass or I'm going to get laid. Like really what was in your soul, what you wrote down in your personal statement because you believed it when you wrote it down. Because it's going to it's gonna be hard. You're going to get depressed. You're going to get angry. You're going to get yelled at. It's going to be a miserable experience. And when you feel miserable, turn back. Remember why you did it in the first place. Yeah. And I think that there is no better profession than, than medicine. Than, it doesn't matter what specialty. Yeah. This, this, is, this art is the thing that 
that drives the people who choose it. And here's the line. At the end of the day, when someone says anything about anything about their job, remember why you do what you do. And that is to bend the wounded, heal the sick, and comfort the dying. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's really powerful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Williams. Uh, again, you know, I'm a huge fan. I love what you're doing, and um, it was great to learn from you. Yeah, my pleasure. It's, like, uh, it's the first time I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And you're a comedian as well, so I love yeah. that too. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for listening into this episode. It was a blast to record. If you have any comments or feedback, send me a message to any of my channels. The Facebook page is www.facebook.com slash the happy doc. The Twitter account is the happy doc one. The Instagram account is the happy doc one. You can send me an email to the happy doc one at gmail.com. And now I have something to ask of you. If you are with my mission of elevating the space of medical care and the medical community, if you are with my mission of elevating the positivity that is within the space, then please comment, like, and share this material. Have a great week, guys, and tune in to a new episode every Sunday.